This is the President McCormack Podcast with your host, Mark McCormack. Ladies and gentlemen, Thurkel Nelson. Mark. T-H- <laughs> Thanks for coming on the podcast. No, I, I appreciate that. Yeah. It's like you, you say, it, uh, it's like a circle with a lisp. Yeah. It's a thurkle. I yes. like it. <laughs> and I just learned, because I just introduced you to one of my other guests, that it's actually Scandinavian, right? Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah my, my dad had a friend in Denmark. Or my dad, uh, my the Nielsen line is from Denmark. Mm-hmm. So I guess my great-grandfather came across the plains. And, uh, and yeah, we were all from Denmark. And my dad had a friend in Denmark whose name was Thurkel Darling. And when he wanted to uh, give me that name, then my mom says, no, no, you're not giving him Thurkel Darling. Yeah. He, you know, he'd get ridiculed with that one. And, uh, and so he says, well, uh, that's fine. So he gave me Thurkel Devon. So, yeah, I, I'm still a Thurkel. Nice. <laughs> so is that your full name, Thurkel Devon Nilsson? Nilsson, yes. Okay, cool. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Yeah. So we just learned you grew up, you were born in Riverton. Yes. How long did you live in Riverton? Uh, so my dad died when I was seven, and we moved when, before I turned eight. So, yeah, the first seven years. Yeah. We had a had a nice place out there with a, a farm with forty acres, and oh, wow. and so you know we we grew up out taking care of the cows and you know my dad trained horses for people and he was he was uh, world renowned for horse training. Okay, uh, he took a lot of the a lot of the shows on uh, pleasure riding and he you know to this day we have a, a silver saddle that that uh, you know he hauled the ingots to down to San Diego to get the saddle built. And so, yeah, there's, there's a lot of good history there. Oh, cool. <laughs> do you, uh, do you remember your dad? I do. Yeah. Yeah. I remember him, uh, you know, he, he was uh, 69 when I was born. Yeah. So no. Yeah. Yeah. He was, he, I think he was 69. Um, and he, he, uh, there was nothing but love there. Yeah. You know, even though we had multiple moms and, uh, you know, it, it was, uh, it was fun. I mean, our, our brothers and sisters to this day are, are so close. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's great having a lot of siblings to lean on and you're kind of your own tribe. Yeah. Oh yeah. So when well, you just piqued everyone's interest by saying you had multiple moms, <laughs> 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 why is that? <laughs> uh, well, so, uh, um, uh, my dad was a part of the LDS church mm-hmm. for most of his life. And, uh, in his later years, then he found the FLDS, and uh, he he felt like that, you know, the the LDS Church had left off a lot of core teachings, and they weren't practicing them anymore, um, due to the manifesto and all that stuff. Um, and he felt like it needed lived, and so he took on some younger younger wives, and started practicing polygamy, uh, plural marriage in the church terms. Uh, but yeah, you know, we, we loved all our moms. Yeah. Uh, it, it, growing up in that was actually pretty fun. Uh, there, you have basically the same fundamentals as LDS church. And, you know, you have the three in one and the history of the church and the, you know, all the teachings, the uh, lectures on faith and, and all of that are, yeah. are basically the same fundamentals. I was gonna say they're pretty much identical, right? Until yes. like 1940-ish. Right. Yeah. Yeah. In the, in the early years there in the forties and fifties, um, they, they started splitting off and they couldn't practice it in the church. Yeah. Um, and so they, you know, Colorado city was founded, you know, in the, in the early years there. And that's where a lot of the people went to, to live their plural, plural lifestyle. Yeah. And, and the church basically, you know, excommunicated them once they started started living that yeah. so they the flds was kind of just a, a a phrase that was coined for them um but they were they were very devout uh believers in the early teachings yeah so so when you're when you're growing up in that community so you so you moved from riverton to colorado city yes okay yeah. about the time you were eight if I... yeah before i was eight i was before actually baptized down there so okay. yes so when you when you grow up in that community, do they refer to, did they refer to themselves as LDS or did they refer to themselves as FLDS? Um, fundamentalists. Fundamentalists. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so, 
but you know, since they all came from the LDS church or the majority of them, yeah. um, then it was just kind of a, the fundamentalist Latter-day Saints. So when you, when you saw LDS people mm-hmm. eventually, right. Did you look at them as like people had kind of fallen away or like more like cousin churches or like, what's, what's your view of like, like a normal LDS person now and in, in, in the lenses of growing up in Colorado city. So in Colorado city, uh, the, the teachings were that we, we were the true church, true followers of the, of the teachings. And you know, the, the LDS church, there was a lot of really good people that we knew. And I mean, you get into hurricane and St. George and, and all these places and there's some great people. Um, they didn't necessarily, you know, agree with our lifestyle, but a lot of the fundamentals were the same. And, you know, we, we had the structure was the same as the LDS church, as far as your quorums and your, your, you know, all the different, um, divisions of, of the church itself. Um, and so you, you really didn't look down on them as, as anything other than, you know, we believe this way and you believe that way. We're trying to live the fundamental laws and you guys gave them up, yeah. you know? So do you feel like that's a totally separate religion or do you feel like it's the same religion or is there, you know what I mean? In the early days, I believe it was, it was a uh, very based off of early teachings. Yeah. Very much. Um, the, you know, once, once they started putting in place, uh, different protocols, the United order and different things they were trying to do down there, then yes, it, it, it changed a lot. A lot of the fundamentals went away. A lot of the, well, I shouldn't say they went away, but they, they came up with new things all the time mm-hmm. for you to comply with that was not anywhere close to the fundamentals. Right. So. Was that all, so was that all under Warren then? Yes. Warren Jeffs? Okay. Yeah. Well, it, it started early on with his father, Rulin. Oh, did it start with Rulin? Okay. Um, but Rulin was more of a, I mean, he came from the LDS church yeah. and he was very, uh, very doctrine oriented. And so he tried to live that way and he expected everybody else to live that way. And when Warren came in, he, he took it and ran with it. Yeah. And if, you know, if the prophet tells you to do something, you just do it. You don't, yeah. you don't, you know, give them the 99 questions on why, <laughs> um, or else you're, you're not, you're not submissive and you're not a, a good steward. Yeah. You know? So, so in Colorado city, when you were, when you were growing up, mm-hmm. it's a, it's a completely closed community, right? Like you don't have like a Methodist down there or a Baptist. No, at that time you did not. Yeah. It was, ev- everyone was the same religion. Um, basically in the, in the early eighties, there was a split. Okay. Um, where the fundamentalist church split up and the, so there was two different divisions of it. Um, there, there was disagreements in leadership and, you know, some of those people are some of the best people I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they were some of my best friends. Yeah. And, uh, when that split happened, uh, we were told to, to not associate with them, even though they're good people. They're my good friends. Um, they, they ended up building another community just outside Colorado city. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, it was basically closed off to that group. Um, because the church owned all, all the land in there, you, there wasn't a lot of people coming in and buying property or building houses that weren't uh, members of the church. So it, the whole thing was controlled by the church, the police department, the, the mayor, the, the fire department, the water board, everything was directed by the church. Yeah. So that was, that was early days. <laughs> <laughs> so it's pop culture currently is interesting, right? Because there's a lot of documentaries and shows and all this stuff portraying different versions of living in Colorado city. Uh-huh. You know? I, uh, I think the first series I ever watched was Big Love. Did you ever watch that? I did not. Do you know about it? I have heard about it, but I haven't okay. watched it. 
one of the things that's really interesting about that is actually based in Riverton and Bluffdale. Yeah, yeah, that's what homes I, were. You know? Yeah, so so that that was a different. Uh, those weren't necessarily the FLDS. Yeah, that was a different polygamous group. Um, which well, they kind of combined them. Do you know the plot with it? I I, I never watched it. Huh? So his second wife came from the from the fundamentalist. Okay, and so and so his first wife, I think he was just married. Don't quote me on this because there's. It's a sensationalized TV show. Uh, really. Right. So I think he had his first wife. I think they were just normal LDS, right? And then he felt called to take on more wives. And then he met the girl from the fundamentalist. And then they brought her on as a wife. Then they find another girl that was just in the community that became the third wife. Okay. And then they built, you know, three houses next to each other and shared the backyards. And then shenanigans yeah. ensued and, you know, made it entertaining. Right. But it was, but they would show, but she would go down and they, it was Rulon that they would portray. They had, you know, totally mm -hmm. different names and everything. And, um, and it was her dad, right? The, the second wife's dad. Okay. And so it, it was interesting how they were kind of marrying everything together. Mm -hmm. Like at the very end of the show, it's interesting. He dies. And, um, his big fear was, cause he loved all of his wives, right? Mm -hmm. But there was major pull, you know, like the fundamentalist wanted kind of her to go back. And he was always like worried about if he ever passed away, like what's going to happen to all of his kids and what's going to happen to his wives. And so the very last scene is him sitting there as a ghost. And huh. all three of his wives are just having dinner with all the kids and it just kind of fades to black. Like everything's cool. Yeah. You know? Well, I, I think you're, you're mixing a couple of them. I think you're uh, mixing rule and all red. With oh, rule and Jeff's. Probably. I think so. Um, <laughs> Set me straight. Yeah. Well, so rule and Jeff's uh, led the fundamentalist group and he had a lot more than three wives. Yeah. I have no idea how many, uh, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and he lived down, well, he lived up here in Sandy for most of his life. And then he moved down in like, I don't know, it was the early two thousands, probably somewhere in there. Then he moved down there permanently. Yeah. So yeah, that's that, two, two separate factions. There. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> well, it makes sense. That's kind of what I'm saying. Yeah. Like on that TV show, it's just like, you don't know. It's not, it's not yeah. factual for sure. Yeah. So, but what about, did you see, have you seen any of the shows Yeah. That they produce? So what's the one like California looking dude that's got the three wives, sister wives. Have you watched that one? Uh, no, I haven't watched, I haven't that watched any of that one either. Okay. No, there, there's a few of them out. Like, uh, there's one on Netflix. It's pray and obey. I watched that one. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that one's based more on the Colorado city fundamentalists. Yeah. Um, there, then there was another one on Peacock or, you know, one of the other channels. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, my sister's in some of those. Oh, is she? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I had, uh, my sister was married to Warren Jeffs mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, she, she was kicked out of the community, oh, two or three times, um, because she was unworthy to be one of his wives. So she went out on her own and tried to make things work and then she'd be called back and that happened over and over. And finally the last round, she says, I'm done. I, I'm moving on. And so she did. What would make her unworthy? Oh, there's a multitude of, of sins. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with sins. <laughs> um, it, it got really interesting. I, I can relate for what happened with me. Yeah. Um, I don't know exactly what they told her, mm -hmm. but when they didn't want you to be part of the church, they would just come up with a revelation that said, you've committed these crimes. You need to go away and repent of them. And... That's kind of, you know, that, well, that is exactly what happened to me is I knew it was coming. I didn't know when, yeah. you know, my, my stepdad was sent away. Um, my, my, uh, wife's dad was sent away for things that, you know, they're, they're still repenting from, uh, I don't know if they even know what it is yet, but, uh, they they had the total control over it. And so if you seem to be a threat in any way or not a hundred percent supporter, then they would deem you unworthy and there'd be a revelation basically to tell you to go away. Um, so in my case, then uh, I get a call from the Bishop and he says, uh, this is the revelation that, that, uh, you're, you need to go away and repent of these things. And, uh, I says, well, what is it? Tell me exactly what it is I've done. Yeah. 
So he reads this revelation, and uh, in there he says that uh, that 23 years ago, before I was married, then I had committed adultery, and I never confessed it. And that is against the, the policies of the church, so I need to you know, go away and repent of that. And when I've fully repented, then I could be called back. But that never happened. Um, and... So I, I had a two and a half hour discussion with the bishop on how can I accept this if it's a total lie, mm-hmm. you know, if, I mean, it'd be a dishonor to me, a dishonor to my family. If, if I walk away from them because somebody told me I did something I didn't do, how, you know, how's that going to go down in the history books? You know, I, I've been a man of integrity. I've been a man that, that, uh, you know, my wife is the only woman I've ever been with. It was an appointed marriage. And, you know, that's, that's the way we believe. That's the way we rolled. And I didn't want it any other way. You know, it's the only way we knew. And so when he told me I, I'd done that and wanted me to accept this revelation, I couldn't accept it. I said, you know, God is a God of truth and he cannot lie. That's what the scriptures say. So if this is a lie, where's it coming from? It, it's not from God, or it would be true. And there's a multitude of things I could have been kicked out for that, that were true, but it, that wasn't one of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so that, that's kind of where, where I realized that for any reason whatsoever, people are, are being asked to go away and leave their families behind and then the church would come back in and gather up the families and reassign them to other, other men. Yeah. And there was no way in hell I was going to let that happen to my family. Um, you know, I, my family was everything. Um, and we can go into to more detail if you want. But, uh, yeah. you know, basically that's what they would do to these people is, yeah. is come up with some off-the-wall thing that... that uh, they can put into a revelation that says they've done it. And if you don't accept the revelation from God, you're not accepting his authority. Yeah. And so you're, yeah, you're, you're revolting, revolting against the church. So now you're an apostate. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And at that point, since you're an apostate, then nobody in the church can have anything to do with you. You're basically cut off and sent out, sent out. So did they, did they consider the risk that you would just take your family and go? Well, they may have. Um, I felt it coming on. I knew it was coming. Uh, so if I back up to, oh, it was probably in the middle of 14, somewhere in there. So my, they, they set up the United Order. And they were trying to get that in place to where um, only qualified people could be in the United Order. But so you might have to tell me what is the United Order? Basically, it's a church uh, doctrine that says everybody lives um, lives off the same means. So everybody puts everything in. Everybody that's part of the order. I mean, you're talking businesses, land, houses, everything, all of your money in, and then you build up the United Order and you buy more property and you, you, you know, build temples and you do all that with it. But only qualified people can be inside that United Order. So a little and, bit like the law of consecration? Yes, a lot. Based off that probably? Mm-hmm. But you're giving everything. You're not giving just your surplus. You're yeah. giving everything. And then you get back out what you need. That's the way it's supposed to work. Never quite worked that way, but uh, that's the way it's supposed to work. Um, and uh, only qualified people could be inside of that group of the elite that were getting the benefits off the United Order. Mm-hmm. And so I was a part of that in the early, early stages of it. And I gave everything. Um, I, had, I had a framing company. We had three crews out going, and, and we had three setups of all the stuff. And um, we were working everywhere from, we went all over the nation, uh, California and Hawaii and Virginia and Seattle and Montana and all over the place. And so, you know, we knew the ro- how to roll. We knew how to, how to get out there and, and do it. 
and it wasn't scary to do that. Um, and, and there's good people everywhere, you know? So it was more of a, um, get you in the box and keep you in the box, uh, program. And if they can keep you in the box, they can utilize you and use your assets and use what you, they need until they have no use for you anymore. Anyhow, so um, that along came a ruling that, uh, well, the bishop decided that I wasn't worthy to be part of the United Order anymore. But my kids were, my three younger kids, or two younger kids. And, and so I let my three-year-old and five-year-old go live with my brother who was worthy and hardest thing I ever did in my life. Yeah. Um, didn't see him for nine months and yeah, it was tough. Yeah. You know, um, were you angry during that? Yeah. Was that the, <laughs> was that the emotion? Uh, stupidity on my part forever, ever letting anybody get between me and my kids. Um, anyway, I, I let him go for nine months and I was, that's a mess. Yeah. And I decided, you know, I'm not going to live without them. And I gotta, gotta do something different. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of my dad, I, uh, I went to, went up to his grave and had a conversation with him. And, uh, you know, I just asked his dad, what do I do? And, you know, it, it came so clear. He says, you get those kids back. And so I did. <laughs> nice. You know, I, I knew, I knew that if I stood up like that, that, you know, it was only a matter of time before, before the church decided that I couldn't be a part of it because that was totally against what they were doing. Yeah. And yeah, it was a, a big decision. So when you got your kids back, did you just go there and take them or did you let your brother know you're on your way? <clears throat> So did you kick a door down? How'd this go? You know, <laughs> I, I called up the bishop's office cause you could never talk to the bishop. You know, I wasn't a member. Mm -hmm. And so all us non-members were, were kind of just put on the back burner. So it was really, really hard to get a hold of him. But yet he's the only one that can make the decision. And so I, I called, oh, probably 200 times. Oh, really? And didn't get through. And were they just saying, well, let them call you kind of thing? Are you talking no, to someone every time or just no, like a voicemail? It would, it would just ring a busy tone after so many rings. Mm. And so finally somebody answered and I just says, Hey, this is Thurkle and I've got to get my kids back. And they're like, well, they're, they're where they're supposed to be. I says, no, they're not. Mm -hmm. I says, those are my kids. And they are coming home and either I'm going to go get them with the law and get the sheriff and we go get my kids or you can bring them home, but they will come home and they're coming home tonight. And I was done. I was so done. And later on that night, I come and knock at the door and here's your kids. Oh, wow. They complied, huh? Oh yeah. Yeah. They came home and, and that was about six months before I actually moved away from Colorado city. Um, so we, we knew it was going to happen. Yeah. We knew that sooner or later the church was going to come in and, and send me away. Yeah. And if they could get their grips on the family, that's where that's, that, I mean, that's where everything gets destroyed. What was it like when your kids came home? Who? You know, it was uh, tender. Mm -hmm. um, Were they happy to be home? <laughs> oh, yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah, they... Uh, <laughs> the, 
my little boy. He was, what, four years old when he came home. And, uh, you know, they, they were so confused, so confused. And they, they didn't know what they had done to deserve that. And it was, it was a long time, you know, building that trust back up again. So, you know, we, we go down the road 10 years later. <laughs> well, not 10, eight, eight years later. Now my son's 12 and you know, about six, six or eight months ago, he comes to me and he says, Dad, I just, I want to know something. <laughs> and he says, what did I do to make you leave me? Uh, it hit hard. Yeah. But what were you able to say to him? How'd you handle it? <laughs> how do you how do you explain to a you know what was happening to a three year old and a five year old? You know, I, I basically just told them that it wasn't something they did. They were perfect. It was me. It was it was something that we were told to do. And in order to keep the relationship with the church and still be included in the church, we had to go through with that. And so it was nothing they did but it was a stupid decision that I made. And, you know, they still live with that. They live with that trauma. Have they, have they accepted the truth of that, though? Um, or are they still upset? You know, I think they've accepted that. They have, uh, <laughs> they have, you know, there's still the trauma there of being left. You know, uh, even, you know, a few months ago when I was getting ready to come come up and go to work in Salt Lake, you know, they come up and wrap their arms around me and start crying. <laughs> um, yeah, they, they feel it. Yeah. You know, it's still there. But, Man, I'm thankful though. You know, we <laughs> right after I got my kids back, then uh, I started planning to get back into construction. And since I'd been a framer and ran crews and knew how to do it, then that was my option, you know. And so, yeah, as soon as I got them back, I started putting together my tools again. You know, I turned everything into the church, everything, and I had to start clear over. Um, but I started building it back up, and then uh, I we did a job in Hawaii, and I knew I, the the bishop told me not to go and get back into construction again. You know, I was I was uh, I was good at sales, and he wanted me to stay in sales with one of the church-owned companies. And uh, I, I really knew that sooner or later that I wasn't going to be part of the church and just didn't know when. And so I gathered everything up and we did a job in Hawaii and then North Dakota. And then I went down through Jackson. I was bidding a, a lodge in Jackson and uh, I fell in love with that area. And 
So we were we were in Victor, right on the other side of, of the line. And uh, so I just rented a place there and moved my, moved my family up there. And about six months after that, I get a phone call, you know, telling me all of these evil things I've done that never happened. And but I had my family with me. Yeah. And you know, they they asked one of the questions was, "Well, where is your wife? Where's your family?" I said, oh, they're right here with me. Would you like to talk to them? He's like, oh, they're with you? I says, yes, they're with me, and yes, we are living in the same house, and we sleep in the same bed. So, yeah, they're with me. And he's like, well, yeah, I don't need to talk to them then. And uh, basically from that point on, we were we were out to, out to uh, make a difference, make a change, and yeah. and we're on our own. You know, and everybody we knew in the church, everybody we grew up with that was still part of it, they cut us off. Um, I had some guys working for me up to that point that we were really, really close, one of my brothers. And uh, we, you know, they were told that they couldn't work for me because I was not a, a good man. And so basically I lost my crew and had to just, you know, start over. Yeah. And, you know, at that point, I, I sat back in my life and, and I, re, I was looking at everything, thinking, where do I go from here? Um, I can't keep framing forever. You know, I'm, I'm getting a little bit old for that. My back's given out. Um, they've wanted to fuse it a few times, um, but we've been blessed and not, not had to do that. Had to go through a bunch of therapy and, and other things to, to still walk. Um, to let it heal itself. But I've, I've always wanted to get into real estate. And so it was at that point I decided I'm, gonna, I'm going to go for my license in Idaho. I'm going to get that license and start selling real estate while I'm still building, still framing and building spec houses. And so that's, that's the direction we went with it. We got our license in, in Idaho. Um, you know, we were up there for a couple of years and then the house that I built in Colorado City came up for a uh, tax sale. And I didn't want to move back. I was done. I did. I was, you know, let's close that chapter yeah. and move on. And uh, the, the UEP called and they says, hey, look, you know, you haven't paid your taxes for however many years. Um, we're going to evict you because technically, you know, I still had the house even though uh, somebody else was living in it. I built it. It was mine. I, I had all the receipts for it, you know, and so you know, I had legal claim on that house. And they says, if you want to keep this, you need to come pay the taxes and then, and then buy it. And so, so I went down and, and visited with the people that were living in it, who happened to be my brother's, brother's family. Um, and I, I just knocked on the door and I was, an apostate, you know, and they didn't want to talk to me at that point. And I just says, Hey, look, you know, the taxes are due on this house and either you need to pay the taxes or they're going to sell the property. Um, I'm not going to let it go and I'll pay the taxes if you'll just pay me. And they says, no, we're, we're not paying a dime, you know? And I says, well, I'm sorry, but the sheriff's coming. Uh, they're going to evict you. And they said, that's fine. Let them evict us. And so, you know, I, I, my rent in Idaho was, was coming due for the renewal. And it was, happened to be the same exact time that the house down there was getting cleared out. And so I packed up all my stuff and loaded it into a semi and we held it down. And the morning that, that I showed up in Colorado City was the morning the sheriff came and evicted them. And then the next day or later that afternoon, I moved all my stuff back in, you know, so it was a, it was a hand of Providence helping me with that yeah. to line everything up, you know, uh, a big change of life. Was the family nervous to move back down there? Yes. They did not want to. Um, but I didn't know what else to do exactly. You know, I couldn't afford two places. And so 
I, I thought that would probably be our best option is to get back down there, take the house, and then and then buy it because you had to pay the, the UEP for it, mm -hmm. for the land. Um, the judge awarded me the house, but I had to buy the land. And so that's what we worked on over the next couple of years is getting that into my name, which it is now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the family didn't want to move back there because of the, the hostilities. Um, well, and it's a little bit different now, though, right? Because how long has Warren Jeffs been in prison? Oh, I think since 06. Oh, has it been that long? Yeah. Jeez, it's been a while. It has. So what's Colorado City like now? There's about, oh, I'd say 10 or 15% FLDS maybe. All that small. Yeah. Yeah, so a lot of people like me have come back and taken their houses and, uh, you know, sold them, renovated them, moved into them, whatever. But a lot of the a lot of the people that are still hanging on to the church beliefs, um, they don't want anything to do with it. Yeah. And so it's a lot of times their kids that'll come and take the house and buy it from the trust. Oh, okay. And so yeah, when I when I first moved back there there was quite a few FLDS just around me. Mm -hmm. Um, but right now uh, I think there's one within you know, a couple blocks. So, so is the, is the whole community kind of revitalized? Yes. Okay. Yep. They changed out the mayors. Um, they changed out the police department. They changed out the, basically everything that was church ran yeah. is getting swapped out hmm. and it's, it's taken a long time to do it, but it's definitely an improvement. How many people are in the community? Well, in the heyday, there was about 10,000. Um, right now there's probably six, six seven, somewhere in there. And Hill, do you, do you count Hillsdale on that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's basically one community. So, um, I live barely on the Arizona side. Right. And if I walk around my block, the North end of my street is Utah, the Utah border. Right. And so, yeah, I, when I run in the mornings and I, you know, take a run into Utah. <laughs> yeah, nice, yeah. Two states every day. Yep. <laughs> so, um, and Hillsdale's get a new high school right now, right? Yeah, they have a new one. Yeah. Oh, is it done? Yeah. Oh. They just did a big... Uh, we did the gym down there. I just... I knew okay. it was in the book, so <laughs> I didn't know it was done. Yeah. Yeah, It's they barely did a big uh, sports complex there mm -hmm. with a big football field and all that. So, yeah, yeah, it's... Yeah, this is the first year my kids have went to the Utah school. Oh, okay. And they like that a lot better. Do they? So it's a lot nicer. So are there restaurants down there, stores? Yeah. Gas oh, stations? Yeah. yeah. Um, B's just put in a really nice restaurant. Or, well, restaurant. They have a restaurant in it. But it's a big grocery store. Okay. Um, I think you've seen it when we went out to Moab. Or out to uh, the, the Slot Canyons. I didn't go to Slot Canyons. Oh, didn't you? Oh. I, uh, I drove home that morning. Um, I had to coach my son's football game. Okay. So I missed the Saturday activities. but Yeah. So I, I drove from uh, Lake Powell to St. George one year, or like two, like last year. And I drove, you know, through the... Through there. What road is it that goes through there? The, I think it's 89. 89? Yeah, sounds right. Yeah. And I just, you know, kind of looked down both sides. But I've always... My, see, my the problem with me is my image of Colorado City is the dark, gloomy, crazy... No. documentary version of it yeah you know well that, that's uh, the view of you know 90 percent of the population has yeah um there were some really cool things though that happened there uh so uncle fred jessup we always referred to him as uncle fred yeah. um he was a bishop for a long time many decades and during that time he would pull people together like no other person and so I'd get a phone call and they'd say, Hey, Uncle Fred wants to do this project. You want to, you want to participate? And I'm like, Oh yeah, Uncle Fred's putting it together. Let's go do it. And I, I loved Uncle Fred. He was a great, great guy. Um, but he would pull people together and we built a two story home in a day, one day. Um, oh. the, the concrete was done. Um, but basically everything else was sitting there. I mean, all the lumber was sitting there, the trusses, the everything, the sheetrock was, was sitting on trucks. You know, it was ready to go. And there's a, a YouTube on that house in a day. Oh, what really? It's called, yeah. Cool. Um, but literally, it's a time lapse of, of building that house. 
And we showed up about four in the morning, started framing, and there was, it was like ants. There were so many people there. <laughs> it was way cool, though, because, you know, when, when we finally left the house in the evening, um, it was getting stuccoed, you know, and we'd help put on the shingles. We'd help do the softened fascia and, and the insulation and all that. And we just, everybody, I mean, if you grew up there, you, you'd know that just because you're a framer doesn't mean that's all you do. I mean, if there's a need for helping someone with electrical, you help them. Uh, if somebody needs to help insulate, you, you just jump in. You learn it. And so for me to be a general contractor was really not that bad because yeah. uh, we already knew so much of the trades. Um, and so, you know, you'd see crews moving around the house that were there all day helping with every phase of it. And, you know, by two or three in the next morning, they moved into it. Jeez. You know, everything was, was done. I mean, sidewalks, you know, grass, it was, it was done. It was pretty cool. Yeah. You know, it was, it was really fun to be involved in. And so there's a lot of that kind of stuff that's overlooked. And, you know, I, I learned to, to work at a very young age. I had my first job when I was 12 and I made $2 an hour. You know, I'd, I'd go into the, to this general store that my uncle owned and, and I'd mop the floor and I'd just help his crew, you know, clean up. And, uh, you know, so from that time on, it was, hey, if I wanted something, I had to go get it. I had to go earn it. I had to go achieve that goal. And so it kind of put me in a entrepreneur, entrepreneur mindset where if I see an opportunity, it's like, how do I get that? Um, even even out when I was first learning framing, it was like it intrigued me. You know, I'd done tile and sheetrock and insulation and stuff well before I ever framed, but framing caught, caught me. And I was like, I like this. It's fun. How do I get to the next level? How do I run a crew? How do I, you know, run my own company now? You know? And, and so that's how it evolved. And it was always, how do I get to that next level? So there, there were so many good things that came out of that, yeah. you know, that, we wouldn't have near the experience that we have if we hadn't had been involved. Well, and plus you're growing up in a community where you have like, like, I mean, the amount of cousins and brothers and sisters and I mean, it's vast, right? So right. you're just like playing with your, I, I had my 90 year old grandma on, well, she's almost 90. I'm calling her nineties. She'll make it there hopefully. <laughs> but, uh, she grew up in Hunter, you know, out in the, the West side of Salt Lake County. And she, her favorite part in life was just growing up with our cousins and all their houses were together, mm -hmm. probably a smaller scale, but you know what I mean? Like there was, she loved that. I mean, what was yeah. that like growing up like that? I loved it. Um, we knew everybody and everybody knew us. Uh, you know, if you didn't, uh, you, you did everything with everybody. You know, if there was a, an event held, you knew everybody that was there. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how it was on the, in the early days. If, you know, I got into, to, uh, you know, dirt bikes and all that kind of fun stuff at an early age and, and you knew everybody. It was like, Hey, so-and-so is on his new bike and so-and-so is over here on a bike. And, you know, you, it was real easy to pull people together and do something. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was, it was great having a lot of family, a lot of friends, uh, you know, and, but if you ever turn against the church, those brothers, your very own brothers, can turn against you in a heartbeat. Yeah. And I knew, I knew that that was part of the consequence. Has that broken up now? I mean, are you talking to your brothers and sisters, or not? Not a lot of them. No, they're still they're still part of they're it. Still in. Yeah. Because Warren's still kind of leading the church from from prison, right? That's what they say. <laughs> right. right, right. <laughs> where do you know where he's at? Is he in? Arizona? He's in Texas. Oh, he's in Texas? Yeah. Oh, right, right. He's in a Texas prison. Yeah. They say it's him giving the revelations and, and all that stuff. And I, I have my doubts. Who do you think it is? I don't know. Somebody else? Somebody else. Somebody else. Yeah. What's your, uh, what's your opinion of Warren Jeffs? Early on, um, 
before he really came into power, he was a fun guy. Um, I didn't know him real well. Uh, but when they moved from Salt Lake, you know, he, he seemed like a pretty fun guy. Um, you know, he was, he was one that would go out and play basketball with the kids and he'd, you know, put on plays and, and do things that, uh, you know, you don't usually see growing ups do. Um, but he, he was, uh, I didn't know him really well. Uh, and, and later on when things start coming out about him, it was like, whoa, you know, that, that, I didn't know that part. Yeah. Um, how much of that stuff is true? Like when you see, what was the one, the documentary search and pray, uh, pray and obey, oh, pray and obey. Uh-huh. How much of that do you believe is true and how much is that sensationalized? You know, it, it, it's interesting. Uh, I, th- I think they have a lot of facts and figures, right? Facts, deadlines, uh, not deadlines, but events that happened like at a certain timeline. time, timelines. Yeah. They, they got that pretty, pretty well down. Um, they stopped it too soon um, before it even got into the interesting stuff. Yeah. You know, it was leading up to it. They could probably have four or five more series on the scene <laughs> and, yeah. and barely, you know, nip the, nip the tip of them. But, you know, it, about that time that the documentary stopped is when, is when uh, things started getting really crazy. And, you know, that's the, you know, I, to answer the question, I didn't know Warren really well. Um, my sister married him. And so, you know, I got to interact a little bit that way. And, you know, on the surface, he was pretty smooth, pretty polished, and seemed to be a pretty good guy. But I think the power got to him. And his true killer showed out. Um, I don't know. I'm not there. I haven't talked to him in, you know, a long, long time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, I don't know how much is true and how much ain't. Um, Are those things, what emotions do you have when you watch that documentary? It was a flash from the past. Um, I remembered a lot of the events, a lot of the things that happened. Um, there was some stuff that happened, you know, in Warren's house and in Roland's house, in their families that I didn't know about. Um, different people's experiences that I had no idea. Yeah. Um, so it, it was it was interesting. Um, you know, they. I, I think a little bit of it is somebody's painting a picture they want to paint. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, the... You know, we, we grew up, uh, well, where to, where to break this at, <laughs> but, um, we, we grew up in a, in a pretty open, open society amongst the community. I mean, we, we were like a lot of teenagers and we'd go out and build the bonfires and have the parties. And, you know, we, we knew the girls, we knew, you know, I mean, if there weren't girls there, it wasn't even a fun party, you know, yeah. but you know, they they paint this picture that everybody was so naive. Yeah. And th- that's not accurate. Um, maybe somebody was that was kept in a shell, but they didn't get out much. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, so that's that's what I I really chuckled on some of those because, yeah. you know, it, they painted that picture that you know, all the, all girls are that way and. It's like, yeah, I don't know what where you grew up exactly, but uh, <laughs> that's not how I remember it. Yeah. But what did you what did you think when Warren when Warren was arrested? You know, I was part of the church then, yeah. and it was a sad day. Um, was because, it shocking? Yes. We well, we didn't know where he was. We had no idea. He'd just been gone for years, and all we knew is that he needed money, so we'd contribute money. And they would send money to him. I had no idea. Oh, yeah, because he was on the run for a while, right? Yeah. How many? Do you remember how many years he was on the run? I don't. Yeah. A while. Yeah. Um, he covered a lot of ground, you know. And when there was a call for money, we'd we'd pitch in money, and you know, we had no idea what it was for or where it went. Uh, really, wasn't our business. We just gave it to the church, and the yeah. church did what they wanted with it. Yeah. So. So kind of turning a corner what was it like assimilating back into we'll call it normal society if we want to call it that <laughs> <laughs> you know with my family 
Yeah. Yeah. You guys um, broke. So 2015, you guys left. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You know, we're 2022 20, right now. I mean, do you feel like there's some distance now? Do you feel like you're kind of, I don't know. I don't want to use the word normal because I don't think anyone's normal. Yeah, if we're, none of us yeah. are normal. But I, I read what you're saying, though. Um, yeah. So we we did not want to be identified as FLDS. Yeah. That was something that that I just said, no way. You know, we're we're not going to dress like them. We're not going to act like them. We do not want tagged with that. Um, that's not us. We we have made a stand, and we have been cut off. And you know, let's live our lives the way that it makes us happy. And so that's really what we did. Is you know, if you want to wear a, a tank top, go wear a tank top. You know, if you want to. Listen to some rock music. Go listen to rock music. So all that was so forbidden. Yeah. You know, it had to, everything had to be homegrown or, you know, home produced. And so even listening to the radio was a sin. I mean, uh, we were told get rid of all of our animals, all of our pedal bikes, all of anything to do recreational, get rid of it. Uh, Four wheelers, dirt bikes, everything had to go. Horses, you know, I had some quarter horses and, you know, they took them out, and I don't know what happened to it, but there was a. They dug a big old hole, and some of these horses uh, expired in that hole. Um, I was pretty upset when I found out about that. Um, you know, especially if you have a papered horse. <laughs> yeah. So to assimilate back into the society, into you know mainstream society, um, you know, I I had worked out a lot with you know, out of town and in different cities. And so it really wasn't that big of a change for me as far as the way I looked, the way I dressed, the way, you know, I, I communicated, um, more for the family because they were the ones kept in the shell, kept in the, uh, kept in Colorado city a lot of the time. And so, you know, we, we basically just says, if it makes us happy, then let's go for it and let's find our own path. Uh, we don't have anyone here to tell us right or wrong. Let's let's choose for ourselves what we feel is right or wrong, and go forward with it. And that's really what you know what drove us. Yeah. So, you know, it, moving back to Colorado City was a little bit rough um, because you had family there, and you know, my first introduction to to the attitude of a lot of the family, I thought they'd be glad to see us. They hadn't seen us in five years or whatever it was. And, and we show back up in the community and, you know, we pulled up at an intersection and they're walking across the road, part of the family. And so we rolled down the windows and said, hello. And, you know, they, they would take these kids and point their heads the other way and say, don't look at them. Don't look at them. And and these are our brothers and sisters and their kids, you know? And so it was a little bit rough, um, assimilating back there. Um, but more and more as time went on, they moved away. Right. And so you didn't get that, uh, resentment anymore because the people moving in next year in the same boat you are, you know, they came back and took their dad's house or they came back and got the house they built. And, you know, so I, I think it's a good, good experience to have gone through. Because we can relate to a lot of things that, you know, some of these other people coming out of different areas, different cults, different groups can relate to. And we, we can, uh, we have empathy there because yeah. we can understand it. Yeah. And it was, it was basically giving everything up to keep the family together. Right. So. So where do you sit right now on religion and God? That's a tough question. Um, I had a real hard time with accepting the fact that the God we were taught about through all of our growing up days was different than the God that gave that revelation. And it made me realize that I there was an ideology 
of who God was that was portrayed to the people. It wasn't go find God inside yourself. Go find a spiritual connection. It was, this is what it says in the book. This is who it is, you know? And, and it was a hard, a hard thing to come to grasp with that there's another connection, you know, uh, there's a, there's who the church follows is not the God I follow. Right. And I know the God I follow led me to get my kids back and led me to move out of the community and led me back to the community. And, you know, he's in everything. And I believe that. I believe that he knows what's best for me. And he will, you know, you can call it the universe, you can call it God, you can call it whatever you want. But things are aligned for us. Yeah. And the church was following somebody's idea of who they wanted us to believe was God. But when, when a God gives a revelation, for instance, that's a flat out blatant lie, <laughs> you, have to, you have to weigh that. That makes you question some things, huh? Yeah, uh, everything, yes. And, and you start going way back. You know, where did this come from? Why was we taught this? You know, would God really do this? You know what I mean? And so you start questioning everything and how, how deep do you want to dig, yeah. you know? And so uh, to answer the question, I, I know there is a God and, and he, he's in every aspect of our lives. But when we take and, and paint a picture of what we think God is and push that on other people, they don't have that connection, you know, inside themselves with what God is. They are being fed something to believe what God is. Yeah. And so that was a, a big uh, change in my life was to come to grasp with that. Um, I, you know, I really know there's a lot more out there for me that I can achieve and I can do. And I feel like it's, you know, breaking out of the shell and, you know, I've been holding this stuff in for so long and getting involved with Jimmy's group and the, we are the, they, and, and people asking me those hard damn questions, yeah. you know, that just get down in my heart. Um, I know there's a lot I can give back, yeah. uh, if I can figure out how yeah. if I can figure out how to be that person that can help somebody else. Yeah. Um, this group has been so good for me, man. So good for me. <laughs> well, I love that. Yeah, I was, that was going to be my next question. You know, we, we were both in a men's group called We Are The They. It's Jimmy Rex's vision, I should say. Um, and that, that's how we met. You know, we yeah. met down in Moab. Um, I don't even know what month we were down there. Was it May? July. Was it July? Yeah. Oh, crap. My life's too busy. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking it was forever ago. It was actually not that long ago. But, um, yeah, it's awesome. I mean, you have a built-in group of guys I want to see you succeed, you know, and it's, and I think everyone gives more than they get, but sometimes there's times where you need to get, you know, you need to receive from people in the group and, and that's the cool part. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, who's your accountability partner right now? Um, I'd have to look up his name. Oh, okay. Are you guys talking? Yeah. We're, we talk, we do it on, uh, on Marco Polo. Oh, no. Oh, you're Marco Polo. Yeah. All right, you're Are you to, too? Oh, yeah. Oh, cool. It's like my favorite form of communication because I I don't even know why. Well, I, my friends are on there. That's why. Uh -huh. I like talking to my friends on there. And I'll just, you might get 10 seconds from me. You might get five minutes. It depends if I'm yeah. in an airport or not, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, his name's Josh. Josh, okay. Josh. Uh, Is it Soward? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah, he's a great guy. And so, yeah, we, we, we talk a couple times a day usually. Do you? Nice. Oh, yeah. Nice. So are you finding the support in the group? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, I had Bracken for a oh, partner I love Bracken. and then, and then I had Leo, yeah. uh, both great guys, yeah. you know, Bracken and I have a, I have a lot of common friends that I didn't know we had people that have come out of the Crick yeah. that he's used in construction. And he's like, dude, these are the best guys, the hardest working guys. I said, yeah, I, I know they're great guys. You know, we grew up with them and he's like, no kidding. Yeah. Um, 
the thing I found about this group that really touched my heart is, you know, there, when, when I left the church, I was on my own. Mm-hmm. It was cut and dried. And basically I could erase everybody in my contact list that was from the church because they're not going to talk to me unless they're outside the church now. And I didn't have a group of people to talk to, to go to. Um, I mean, we were always swinging deals and doing things with, you know, members of the church that were our friend group, mm-hmm. uh, you know, taking on big projects and little projects and, Hey, I need this house or can you do this house? And you know what I mean? And just working together and all of that support and camaraderie was gone at that time. It just, it was cut clean. And, and so I was on my own. It was if, if I don't, if I don't do it, I don't eat. So I got to freaking figure out how to do it. And so I made some really good friends. Um, I, I guess I have a natural tendency to make friends, um, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, but there was some people in Idaho that really, really, uh, I enjoyed them, enjoyed their company. They were LDS people. They were great though. Um, you know, we, we did a lot with them. Uh, but it wasn't the, the kind of support that I found in this group. And I come into this group and there's 50 guys in there that would give you the shirt off the, off their back. I mean, give you anything to help another brother. And that is, was very emotional to me because I had finally, finally found a group of people that I could really relate with and feel like that I could be open with and I'm not going to get judged for it, Mm -hmm. you know? And, you know, a lot of the outside perspective on the FLDS is not a very good perspective, you know? And so I, for so long, I didn't want anyone to know I was FLDS or I was from there. And, you know, more and more it's like, Hey, you know, we, we did have this chapter in our life and let's acknowledge it for what it is. We got a lot of good out of it. And to, to be able to open up with the men about that has been really good for me. Really good. Um, you guys have pulled more out of me than, than what I ever thought would come back up. (laughs) Well, I hope it's freeing for you. It is. I mean, I think, this is, you know, the gospel of Mark McCormack, right? But it's, uh, I, I just think people should just be them, you know, take me or leave me, you know, like it just creates such better relationships in your life, you know, cause you just, yeah, I grew up FLDS and shit yeah. happened. I didn't like it. I moved on from, you know, I mean, everyone changes. Yeah. And I mean, I left the LDS church, the mainstream one, mm-hmm. uh, like 13 years ago. And I, I don't, uh, project that on people very often. You know what I mean? Like, but if you want to come talk to me about it, I'll talk to you about it all day, you know, like, but you kind of got to talk to me about it. Right. Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, I just, I feel like it's part of my life and I, I'm, I'm happy to discuss it with people that are interested in why, why I left or, you know, why I didn't stay. Some people take that position, you know? And, uh, I just, I feel like the more honest and open I am about my life and my thoughts and my feelings and, and uh, the reasons why I've changed my mind on things, you know, I just feel like I connect with people deeper and, you know, you just have yeah. these friendships that just, just get forged and wedged and, you know, it's just, they're awesome, you know. And I think we are the day gives us the opportunity to do that. When I say gives us the opportunity, it forces us to do that, Yeah. right? I mean, Moab was wild. I, I had no idea what to expect, you know. You know, I've told this story a few times on the podcast, but... I, uh, I told you, I mean, I do anything but jump off the cliff. And so I was pretty much all in for everything, right? I was like, oh, you want to, we're sharing feelings now? Let's share some feelings. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, you want to write a list of, you know, things we're good at? Let's do that. You know what I mean? And, mm-hmm. and uh, but I just, I, I don't know, I thrive in that environment. I love it. I love getting to know everybody and, and hearing people's stories. And, and I think you're right. There is no judgment. I mean, I, I could barely tell you who's LDS, who's not, who, what religion other people are at. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, obviously being, you know, FLDS peaks people's, I think it peaks people's interest for a minute until then they get to know you. And then it just, just, yeah, he was FLDS at one point. You know what I mean? Yeah. It almost normalizes it. Yeah. Well, it's, so. it, it's a stigma that, 
that you know I, I know some of the guys that we went to uh to the the slot canyons yeah they drove through colorado city yeah and this was like what two weeks ago three weeks ago yeah yeah we drove they they decided to drive through colorado city but there's still a stigma there that says oh don't go in colorado city you're gonna get followed they have they have the security force that's going to pull you over and run your plates and and check everybody in the vehicle and you know who you are well if that was 20 years ago i can see that happening but today uh, there's no such thing yeah but there's still th that same stigma yeah. there's a couple guys that did that and they told me dude we were scared as hell going through there. <laughs> we, we were literally watching for the cars following us yeah, to see if somebody was going to call our plates in and, and the cops were going to come pull us over. And, you know, that, that's such a, a far cry from where it is today. Yeah. You know, it's a beautiful place. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, I, I, the mountains, everything around us is so beautiful. There's an energy there that is really good. Yeah. Um, and as, as we improve it and clean it up, and get rid of the old and in with the new, I think we'll experience a lot more of that growth. Oh, yeah. When you, yes, that's why I was really interested when I said, you know, is the area revitalized, you know? Because mm -hmm. it is gorgeous. It is beautiful. I mean, it's, yeah. uh, it's also fun, right? I mean, it's on the border of Arizona, and you have this, I'll say, crazy history, right? Uh -huh. I mean, all of Utah's a crazy history. These nutcases yeah. move from... <laughs> east coast out here you know and like just was like this is it we're sick of walking you know I mean? <laughs> build it <laughs> not another step that that's my yeah. attitude about it you know like everyone's like oh this is it it's a wonderful thing i'm almost like we've been to the mountains this valley looks great let's do it <laughs> no one's here this yeah. is it yeah there's a lake all right we'll take that you know <laughs> a couple streams let's go yeah yeah so oh, yeah. i appreciate it man i appreciate you coming on the podcast oh thank you thank so, you I mean, you drove all the way up this morning, didn't you? I, I came up last night. Oh, did you come up yeah. last night? Good. Yeah. Good, good, good. You know, more more than anything, Jimmy asked me a question, and, and he says, uh, you know, what, I, I think you were involved in, in this in St. George, but he says, what part of your story would you rewrite? You know, what? how would you tell your story? And I, I thought on that, you know, and I, I held a lot of anger for a long time against a God that I was told was God. Mm -hmm. And I had to let that go. And I had to look at the benefit of, because of that event, is why I'm who I am today. And give it that, that credit. Um, you know, there, there's beauty in everything if you look for it. And I, it makes me so thankful, though, that we can get out now and create the life that we want. You know, I, I'm in real estate. Uh, I'm licensed in Utah and Arizona. And I did that because we're right on the border. Mm -hmm. And a lot of Utah agents that do St. George Hurricane, that area, can't go across the border. And we live on the border. And so it, it only made sense to do that. Um, that that's one of the big the big things that I enjoy doing is, is real estate. Um, the other thing is I, I have a side by side and I take my kids out and we go in the mountains and, you know, that's, that's the happy place. Yeah. Um, and that area is so good for that because you have the Arizona strip. I mean, we went out, spent, you know, what, six or eight hours out on the, the buggy the other day. Um, didn't pass another, another buggy. Well, we did we passed a couple. Um, but you know, you're 60 miles out from, from a gas station. You know, yeah. and, and you're just way out there. Yeah. But there's, it's endless. You can explore for days, and my kids really, really like that. Yeah. So I, I enjoy being in that area for that reason. Yeah. You know. But getting to know you guys has, has been totally cool. You know, a <laughs> uh, lot of connections I never would have dreamed of. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy, when he, when he interviewed me for being part of the group, and uh, I told him, I said, I, I don't know, Jimmy. You might kick me out once you find out who I really am. <laughs> Jimmy's like, dude, don't even give me that. He said, just trust me. Get into this group and trust me. And I had to sit back and think about that, you know, and, and it's been so good to trust him and watch what happens out of that. And the relationships that are developing and the connections we have are so good.
because of that moment of trust. So, yeah, I, I love it. Good. Good. I like that a lot. Well, I end my podcast with asking up one final question. And that okay. is, I need to hear your best two minutes of advice. Well, if you have something you want to do, something that you love, get all in. Do it. Don't let anybody steal that dream from you. Um, early on, I, I had the experience of, of the church leaders telling me not to do certain things that I really was passionate about. Um, yeah. The moment I got a chance, I did it. And I have loved every moment of it. So don't let anyone steal your dream from you. Pursue it with everything you have. Um, family is everything. Do it for you. Do it for your family and your posterity. And don't look back. You know, the, you can't change the past. You can only change the future. And that's what I've, I've come to realize in my life is I can change my future and I am changing my future. So I say let's rock it. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Hey, I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the President McCormack Podcast, brought to you by McCormack Foundation, Saxton Fund, ADP Lemco, and Professional Floor Systems. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast and keep up with Mark on Instagram at President McCormack.